Welcome back to the Pharma Forum podcast. In today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Michael Rudnicki, co-founder and CSO of Satellos Biosciences. We discussed the field of muscle stem cell research and Michael's own work in the field, specifically as relates to developing novel therapeutics for those who live with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, or DMD, and other degenerative muscle diseases. It's been a fascinating journey, and the potential of this line of regenerative medicine research is palpable. Indeed, Michael goes into the finer details of his research over the years and looks to the future also, with hope to progress through Satellos' Phase 1 and Phase 2 trials and improve the lives of DMD patients, markedly improving their quality of life. Tune in, and please feel free to let us know your comments. And as ever, thank you for listening. This is web editor Nicole Raleigh, and today I have with me Dr. Michael Rapnicki, co-founder and CSO of Satellos Biosciences. He is also a senior scientist and director at the Regenerative Medicine Programme and Sprott Centre for Stem Cell Research at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Satellos Biosciences is dedicated to developing novel therapeutics for those who live with Duchenne muscular dystrophy and other degenerative muscle diseases. Founded on research in muscle stem cell biology, the company's lead drug candidate is an oral small molecule medicine in development as a potential disease-modifying treatment for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Muscle stem cells, for those who might be wondering, are adult stem cells present in skeletal muscle tissue, which can self-renew and are capable of giving rise to skeletal muscle cells. These stem cells are activated in response to muscle injury to regenerate damaged muscle tissue. Given all this, it is therefore probably no surprise that today Michael and I will be discussing the work of Satellos and the general progress that has been seen in the field of muscle stem cell research since 2007, when he first identified and defined a subpopulation of muscle, aka satellite, stem cells capable of self-renewal and regeneration. But before we dive into what has been happening over the past 17 years, perhaps you could tell listeners and myself a little bit more about your journey to today, Michael, working in regenerative medicine. Tell us what inspired you to follow the scientific path to stem cell research and, of course, co-founding Satellos. Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Nicole. It's a real pleasure to be here. So I trained as a molecular biologist, as, as a graduate student. Uh, I think what brought me to molecular biology was was my undergraduate training, and then before that, you know, um, in high school, uh, reading the selfish gene and the double helix, and and getting really excited about this brave new world of genetics and genes and et cetera. Um, I trained in a lab that uh, worked with uh, embryonal carcinoma cells, which is what we worked with before. Uh, embryonic stem cells had been derived. And they're very similar, except they come out of a tumor, a teratocarcinoma, but they do much the same things in terms of their characteristics. The lab I trained in, my supervisor, Michael McBurney, had had uh, trained himself with um, uh, James Till and Ernst McCullough, which are the two scientists who were the first to prove stem cells exist working in Toronto in the early 1960s, and their work really defined uh, the concepts, the lexicon, and trained uh, uh, all kinds of people who continued in stem cell research. So I was really inculcated and incubated in, in the, the stem cell culture with a cancer spin, but um, uh, I was um, uh, being formed as a stem cell biologist from the very beginning as a graduate student. Uh, from there, I went into to uh, my postdoc. I went to, into the lab of Rudy Yanish, uh, and I was amongst the. I think there was two postdocs and a, and a graduate student working with embryonic stem cells to try to get gene targeting up and going. And our cohort were the first bunch to to do that successfully with genes that themselves were not selectable, and and that led to a, a whole series of landmark papers coming out of Rudy and, and other labs. Uh, about that time, and that brought in, uh, you know, the golden era of mouse molecular genetics, I would say. So the, the regenerative medicine angle 
you know, it, it, as a student and a postdoc, it's really the joy of discovery and trying to figure out how things work that that is uh, rewarding in a, of itself. And and the, the whole um, idea and thinking around regenerative medicine, I guess, really didn't occur till sometime later when it became apparent that there's a real therapeutic potential for moving forward and 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 transforming the delivery of, of medicine by by harnessing the power of, of stem cells that exist within our body and and also without most of regenerative medicine is thinking about um cell transplant or organoid transplant or or artificial organs using things from outside to put in um but um i think very early on some of us a small minority of us began to think well the the more we know about mechanism, and that's something I was always very, very interested in, was mechanism rather than the phenomenology of stem cells, but in what makes them tick. Uh, that as we understand this, um, that perhaps we could begin to drug these cells and different tissues and, and stimulate our endogenous regenerative process, which is very, very robust, especially when we're younger. It does slow down when we age. But if we can harness in a specific way our body's own regenerative processes by targeting the stem cells and specific mechanisms that are in those stem cells and develop a pharmacopoeia that can do that, I think we'll have really arrived at the, the, the era of regenerative medicine, in my view. And, uh, and Frank Gleason, the CEO of Satellos, and I met uh, uh, in the early 2000s um, when he... Um, he was on the board of the Canadian Stem Cell Network, and I, in I think about 2004, I came on board as a as the new scientific director, CEO, and so he mentored me. I was a wet behind the ears of that kind of executive position. He became chair eventually, but both him and I shared a vision that by understanding mechanisms of stem cells, we could develop drugs that target them, and um, uh, as a consequence, uh, him and I. I initiated multiple programs uh, in the stem cell network to do just that, grant funding projects, uh, funding projects that, that were doing that with some success. But that also led him and I to spin off a company together. Uh, and now we have this company that is whole focus is to drug stem cells to stimulate regeneration. Gosh, thank you for that. That's quite a journey and wide ranging, as you say, from your early days with the cancer spin, forming you into what you do today. So I want to focus on these these notions of your foci, of how things work, what makes these stem cells tick and mechanism, and also those landmark papers you were mentioning early on, and talk about the specific seminal paper that you published in 2007. I was wondering if you could provide listeners with a brief overview of the findings of that before we go into the specifics of what Satellus does. Yeah, this is a, a cell paper, and we, we made a, a really surprising discovery. Using a, a system for lineage tra tracing in muscle stem cells, we observed, looking down the microscope, when we cultured the myofibers, these strange couplets of cells that were um, derived from a single cell division that were at right angles to the muscle fiber, and uh, we could see that one cell was derived from the other because of this lineage tracing system. And it was a really odd looking event. And, uh, you know, the penny dropped that this was an asymmetric cell division. And an asymmetric cell divisions had been noted in other tissue types and so on, mostly in model systems like flies and worms. But there had been some uh, landmark studies by Elaine Fuchs in skin and others of the brain uh, where these had been noted or the retina, but never in muscle. Uh, although about the same time, uh, uh, an investigator in Paris was Shogim Tajbash and had also noted them using a, a different system. But um, that also allowed us to prospectively isolate these cells because they were marked with this lineage tracing system and transplant them in it and characterize them that way. And what we found was that the daughter cell that was more differentiated did not engraft at all well. And when we damaged the muscle, did not repopulate at all well. Whereas the upstream cell, what we thought was the stem cell didn't graft well, uh, and when transplanted, actually increased in number. So it had characteristics of what we call a long-term self-renewing stem cell. Uh, and so that was really um, a very exciting development and also a really powerful tool to drill down uh, into 
the molecular regulation of asymmetric division in a mammalian stem cell context, which really hadn't been done before because these cell, stem cells are so rare, typically it's very, very difficult to do. And, um, or the tissue is so convoluted and complicated that the cell analysis is difficult. In muscle, the, the basal lamina is long and straight, so everything is parallel. So you can really visualize these events quite readily. Um, so it's a really powerful tool. And so we've published a whole series of papers making use of the system. And this same lineage tracing system uh, allowed us to make this really key discovery in, in MDX mice, the mouse model for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, we were we had bred in the lineage tracing system into these MDX mice for other reasons. And but what we found was that there was a real paucity of asymmetric divisions. There weren't very many of them. And and we didn't really understand why. And so we thought, well, maybe it's the in, inflammatory environment. So we did a knockdown to to reduce dystrophin expression and it and it occurred. We lost asymmetric division. So that was really weird because dystrophin wasn't supposed to be expressed in uh, muscle stem cells. The prevailing notion was that it was only expressed in differentiated muscle fibers and wasn't in stem cells. So we went looking by RNA seq. We went looking by uh, with antibody, and sure enough, the, uh, the amount of RNA is extremely high in a quiescent muscle stem cell. And as the cells activate and set up to enter the cell cycle, the amount of protein skyrockets. Very high levels of protein, even though it's a huge protein. There's a long period of time before the first cell division occurs, about 30 hours and 30, 36 hours. And that's enough time for the RNA to be converted into protein because there's so much of the RNA present. And so that was a, a really paradigm shifting discovery. This paper we were published in Nature Medicine in 2015, where we showed that uh, there's this reduced severely reduced levels of, of asymmetric division in Duchenne muscular dystrophy because of the lack of dystrophin in the stem cell and that the stem cell has a role in polarizing the, the cell as a signaling molecule. It recruits a kinase uh, called PAR1B or MARC2 is another name for it. And that sets up the polarity within the cell, making the apical surface different from the basal surface. And the lack of dystrophin, these cells are lost in space. They don't know where up and down is. So it's difficult for them to orient uh, on the muscle fiber. They can still occur by chance because it's randomized to some extent, these asymmetric divisions, they have to occur at 90 degrees to the, to the basal lamina. Uh, and, and the consequence of this is reduced generation of progenitors. Uh, and that reduction of the numbers of progenitors leads to reduced differentiation and a reduced ability to repair. And using gene deletion studies in mice, we showed that if you delete only the muscle fiber, and this is also work done earlier by Kevin Campbell, looking at a part of the complex called uh, DAG1. You need only the muscle fiber, you have very mild muscular dystrophy with uh, efficient regeneration. And if you delete in the stem cell and the muscle fiber, you have poor regeneration and, and a really aggressive disease phenotype. So you need both the ongoing muscle damage, the muscle fiber, and the reduced ability to repair it, and you have the full-blown progressive disease. So for listeners, in case you weren't following that, Michael has been describing the paper from 2007, the paper from 2015, the development, if you will, of this research into muscle stem cells and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So now, Michael, I'd like you to sort of describe what Satellis is doing now and what it was doing in the beginning when it was founded um, I think it's between five and six years ago. And also perhaps you could provide further insight for listeners into the application of muscle stem cell research in degenerative muscle diseases generally. Yeah, so uh, on the, following the uh, discovery of the loss of asymmetric division in, in DMD, uh, we set out in the lab to identify signaling pathways that would uh, alter asymmetric division in muscle stem cells. and. The first experiment we did was a, a very talented graduate student, Will Wang, who's now an assistant professor at the Burnham Institute in California, did a, uh, a small drug screen, about 300 compounds. The goal really was pathway uh, discovery. And, uh, and he set up a, a screen where we could identify decreased or increased symmetric division. It was um, basically he was genotyping the the cells in the lineage tracing system on cultured fibers. 
Uh, and uh, this now is a, we've now created a high content version of the screen, but at this time we had to do it by, by PCR. And he discovered the um, inhibition of the EGF pathway drives symmetric expansion and activation of the EGF pathway, EGFR aurora kinase A pathway drove uh, asymmetric divisions. And there was drugs that did this. Uh, and we've subsequently identified phosphatase that are specifically expressed in, in muscle stem cells um, that, that if we inhibit it, it prolongs activation of the EGFR and drives asymmetric division. And, and that uh, was actually the moment we decided to form Satellus. And uh, we, we set out to try to drug this phosphatase, which we did do. Um, but at the, in parallel, we um, did a high content screen with a curated library of siRNAs against multiple pathways and and multiple druggable targets and that led us to the identification of our current target that we're very excited about that that modulates uh, the notch gradient across stem cells and the reason why we're excited about that is because of the existence of human modifier genes that really um, uh, ameliorate disease progression in DMD that are in the notch pathway uh, that's worked by by Mayana Zatz and Lou Kunkel, and um, and we identified a, a novel target uh, that when we drug it, uh, it's not a mitogen, it doesn't change cell proliferation, it changes the quality of cell division of these multi stem cells, and stimulates asymmetric division, and enhances regeneration, and and uh, leads to increased force generation and and reduction in damage. We believe. But it really was that first work with EGFR and Aurora Kinase A that, that uh, led us and uh, interested uh, investors to, to spin out a company to address this problem, a new way of, of treating the Duchenne muscular dystrophy and to modulate stem cells. Absolutely brilliant. So where next for Satellus? Where next indeed for this particular field and stem cell research generally in the next, I don't know, decade? Well, in the short term, we're pushing hard to, to uh, uh, get our phase one clinical trial done and then move into our POC and phase two trials. And that's very exciting to, to participate in that. You know, for a, essentially I've been a basic scientist all my career trying to figure out how things work. And it's, it's really quite exciting to, to participate in an enterprise that's, that's pushing your discoveries into the clinic. And, but more importantly, it's the opportunity to do something to improve the, the lives of these patients and hopefully extend their lives and markedly enhance their quality of life. But where's next? Well, uh, we have a bunch of other targets uh, in our back pocket that we're, we're uh, really interested in, in evaluating. And that, that's one thing. Uh, also, um, uh, where else? Uh, what other stem cell diseases or muscular dystrophies uh, can we in particular can we extend this treatment to um, that's all those are all very interesting questions but i like to think that uh, that this the screening system we've established um, has enabled the formation of a platform that allows us to understand different ways of modulating stem cell function and and many of these things will be relevant uh, to other uh, cell types uh, stem cell types, we, we believe, but we're not stimulating proliferation. So we're only modulating stem cells that are dividing. So it's a regenerative context, if, if you follow me. Yes, absolutely. All very interesting questions, many of which you are answering, it seems, Michael. Thank you very much for your time today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. And so that concludes another episode of the Pharma Forum podcast. You can find out more information about this episode, including a download link and information about previous installments of the series at pharmaforum.com forward slash podcasts. The Pharma Forum podcast is also available on iTunes, Spotify, Acast, Stitcher and Podbean where you can find and subscribe by searching for Pharma Forum. Of course, don't forget to visit our website itself, where you can sign up for daily news and analysis bulletins, and follow us on Twitter, or X nowadays, at at Pharma Forum. That's all for now. Thank you for listening.